Okay, Elaine, you're very welcome to the Streets of Dublin Simon podcast. Thank you very much. Season two. Um, thanks so much for joining us. Um, can you maybe start us off by telling us your name, your role and how long you've been with Dublin Simon? Uh, yeah, my name's Elaine Barnett. I am working in Dublin Simon, I'll be two years in April um, and I'm the independent housing manager. Okay. And what what inspired you to be uh, working in homeless services? Um, I think I've always done it. Like, I mean, I'm 20 odd years in social care. I leave the odd off <laughs> 20 odd years in social care. Um, just a natural progression. Like when I was younger, I was in youth groups and that and then just youth leader. And um, then I had an interest. I went back and done addiction studies. I was in the homeless services and I've worked in a whole different range, not just homeless. I've worked in a different range of services in the social sector. So um, teenagers, older people, women and children. Um, and then homeless men, homeless women, homeless mixed um, women and children fleeing domestic violence. So, yeah, I've had a range of experience um, in the social sector. Wow. OK, so you, you've done it all, really. Yeah, um, I suppose I went back to college in 2005. I've done the housing and community study, um, honors degree there. And I was so I was interested in the housing side, but because mm-hmm. I think in all the when you're working in the homeless services it's constantly about housing 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 mm. so it's about how you manage it so I, I, that kind of I, f- I was interested in that area mm. um, so I went back and then yeah found, came into the housing side of it yeah and I suppose as you say it touches like all those different groups you know mm. if, if people are vulnerable like housing is always kind of at risk do you know yeah. what I mean so it's it's kind of a key factor whatever the, the vulnerable group is do you know what I mean well it's your base it's yeah. your home it's your safety net it's your closure door you know mm. so how are you supposed to deal with any of the other issues in your head or in your life if you haven't got a safe space to go at night time? Yeah. Do you know? So if we don't have that, what are we supposed to do? No, 100%. Um, can you tell us maybe a bit about the independent housing service? What does your team do? Um, yeah, I suppose it is what it says on the tin. It's uh, it's independent housing. So it's we deal with the kind of forever homes you know that term is out there forever homes so we do with that so at the moment we have 288 properties um over five counties um and we we work with people that have all come from the homeless list as well so they would have all got their their um their, their properties then from us mm-hmm. they would have been nominated through the council the majority would nominate it through the council and they come to us so yeah so they have their properties um we main look at look after the properties, we maintain the properties um, and then if there is any issues or anything going on, we, we work with the tenant to go through them. Mm-hmm. And that's, I suppose, the side of the organisation where we're actually providing homes for people. Oh, 100%. Yeah. Yeah. And that's kind of in our role as like an approved housing body. So it's kind of us, it's moving into the the landlord space, if you like, yeah. um, a little bit. But um. Can you maybe, why do you think that's necessary, I suppose? Why do you think it's necessary for us to do that, for in, to move into that independent housing space? Because that's the end game. The, the end game, when you're going into a homeless service, anyone that's in any of the homeless services at the moment, their end game is to get their own houses, to get their own property, to get their own home, whatever name you want to put on it. That's the end game. So, like, we need to be there and we need to make sure that people are successful in their tenancies as well. You know, so yes, we are like the landlord, but we're not as well. You know, we're an AHB, we're an approved housing body. And like the other approved housing bodies that's out there, um, you know, we're, we want to see people succeed in their tenancies. We want it to be forever and uh, we want them to be part of the community. Um, So that's that's why we do it. That's why that's why I think Dublin Simon got into this end of the game is because you want to see people on the final stages of their journey and mm-hmm. leave them to it then. Let yeah. them live their life. And help keep them there as well. Yeah. yeah. And I suppose if that's the, as you say, the end game, if the end game is keeping this person in their forever home where they belong, mm. that's the focus. There's no other kind of like competing interest there. There's no maybe pressures from maybe family or, you know, different areas. It's uh, it's just about the person, the tenant living in the house at the end of the day. 100%. Yeah. Uh, where they have a safe space to go to at the end yeah. of the day. Yeah. You know, where they can... They can be who they want to be. They can deal with whatever's going on in life um, and just have their own properties, have their own homes mm. and be there. Mm. Um, and I suppose the way that it's different from a landlord is, uh, again, we've kind of touched on that, but it's about, um, from you know, from what I know of the service, it's, and correct me if I'm wrong, but it's about kind of creating, you know, stable kind of, sta- stable tenancies for people, stable rents, um, you know, 
people being able to meet the kind of meet meet the levels of rent and meet the um meet meet their their kind of obligations. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Especially when the market is spiraling out of control the way it is. Hundred percent. I mean, we're not for profit. Do you know? Yeah. Like that's the thing about us. Um, and I suppose in a way as well, Dublin Simon will be a little bit different from other AHBs in that we we could buy next door to you. You know, so we don't buy or build the big blocks of apartments and that that's there. Not yet. I don't know if that's something we'll ever do, but at the moment, that's not what we do. We buy off the market. Um, so we put people in to communities that are already established as well. Now, we could have a couple of properties in the one area, um, but by and large, we kind of have those standalone um, properties that are in, in already in a community. Mm. Um, like Pepper Potton is the phrase that she was, and that's that's what we do. Um, so that, you know, you're hoping you, is that people will then fit into the community and be part of the community. And that again, helps them stay there forever, sustain the tenancies, be part of something, you know, so that's why we do that. Yeah, the pepper pot and piece is really interesting because yeah. I suppose, you know, in housing kind of like studies and housing theory and stuff, there's um the idea of kind of like, you know, ghettoizing people by putting yeah. them all in the one area and um without having like proper facilities or supports around them. So I suppose mm. the pepper potting is kind of, it's it, it's what we do because we respond to the market, but it's also a strategic piece by us yeah. as well, isn't it? Oh, 100%. Yeah. You know, the, and that's what I said, we could buy two or three in the one area. Yeah. You know, we yeah. could, but we don't do the blocks mm -hmm. um, because all of our tenants that come to us, they're from the homeless list as well. So again, what you're saying is you're stereotyping, you're building those blocks. We're trying to get away from that. We've seen the, the history. We've seen how that hasn't worked. Mm -hmm. You know, we've seen how... You're building all these homes. Home, 100% is the way to go. You need your home before you can do anything else. But you also need your amenities around you. You need your supports around you. Mm -hmm. You know, that you have to have your base. And once you have your base, you can tap into your supports then. Mm -hmm. But if you don't have your amenities, your schools, your transport, your your shopping, your your health clinics, your all those supports out there, if you don't have them there, what are you doing? So that's why we do it. So you're putting people that are already, they were, the communities are already established. Mm -hmm. And then you have all your your youth groups are established and, the, you know, the children's groups are established. So if there is families there or, you know, men's sheds are there, whatever it is that's there, you're tapping into what's already there. Mm. Um, so that's it is. It's a strategic reason why we do that. No, 100 percent. What's what's your team's vision or your your team's goal? Um. I, do you know what? In the 20 odd years that I'm doing this job, my, I've I thought always, you were living at the odd. The odd. The odd, <laughs> the odd is very small. <laughs> Um, but in the 20 years that, that I'm doing it, I've always said I'd love to put myself out of a job. You know, that's always been my end game no matter where I go is to put myself out of a job that there's no need for me anymore. Wouldn't it be great if there was no need for us anymore? Wouldn't, you know, that's always been the end game. Now, obviously, in this side of my career, it, uh, we would be there to sustain the tenancies, mm -hmm. you know, but wouldn't it be great if we were looking for people off the homelessness to put them on instead of, outcry for homes and waiting lists so long you know wouldn't mm. wouldn't it be great if we were, had to go look for people mm -hmm. <laughs> to put in these homes yeah so yeah put myself out of a job that's me end goal um yeah that would be it um who's who's your typical client group there's no one make shape or form of people um that come through the door it's you know it's everybody comes from the homeless list but as you know People that are presented as homeless um, come in all different range and shapes and sizes and backgrounds. Um, we have some people that are working in fantastic jobs. We have some people that are business owners. Um, you know, we have some people that have been through the system um, from maybe the age of birth, you know, been through the system, um, been through the care system, been through the prison system, um, been through addictions. We have... We've all mixed and shapes with people that are not from Ireland that we have to have translators when we're there. So we've all mixed and shapes and sizes of different people that come. So we don't have a typical client group, do you know? And I think I've always found that, mm. um, that no one size fits all. You mm. just have to take people as they come to you. Mm -hmm. um, everybody's an individual and everybody has their own story. Um, but as I said, like even people with their own businesses and that have found themselves that are in homelessness because of the way the market is as well that's out there mm, you know. I'll change the question a little bit then because obviously there's no like there's no stereotype anymore like homelessness yeah. can really happen to anyone but I suppose are there is there any particular trends that you're seeing with the people who are coming to your door like obviously people are spending longer than ever before in emergency accommodation is that something is that kind of like 
exhaustion and fatigue something that you can really feel with your clients when they're coming through? Yeah, you would see people saying like, I've spent years in a hotel. I've spent years. I don't know how they did it. I don't know how they do it. I have two children myself. And I remember even the pandemic and people were struggling. And I was like, how are you struggling? You know, like I have a garden. I, you know, the kids have their own room. We've got tellies. I don't know how people did it in hotels and one rooms and everything. You know, the strength and resilience of people have been unreal. Um, and it's always fascinated me. Always throughout my whole career, people's strength and resilience fascinates me. Mm. So, yeah, you know, when you see people or you hear people saying, I was in a hotel, then I was in the hub, or then I was, you know, I was in this service, that service. Or you even hear people saying, I'm 10 years on the list. I'm... 12 years in, in this accommodation, that accommodation, and you're thinking, holy, like, mm. how, how have you been that long? Mm. You know? Mm. So, yeah, that, that you, we would hear a lot of that as well. And that, mm. they're the best. They, that's, you know, when you can walk with someone then and you're at the end of their journey, it's great. Mm. Mm. No, 100%. So my next question is around, I suppose, the supports that your team provides for, for people who are coming <clears> to, to your service. What, what How does your team help them? Um... Well, we would link them in with supports as well. So we wouldn't be the actual force face of support that people would say. We we would signpost them maybe onto supports as well. So mm. if someone is struggling, so even from the start of tenancy, when we get someone into a tenancy, we could have a SLE support in place where they would um, help them for six months settle in. So set up the very practical things like their bills, getting their grants, um, buying buying the furniture. You know, people have never had to buy these stuff before. If If... They've come from that institutional background. They've never had to buy. They don't know how to buy. They don't know how to measure a floor. They don't, you know, so the lease support is there. Um, and that's something we wouldn't be able to do. We wouldn't have the manpower to do that. But that's why we put them onto the SLEE. And, you know, we'd often say we'd wait until that referral is in. to have Because it's so important that someone gets the best start. Moving into your new home should not be that stressful. I know it's a stressful time for everybody if they're moving, but it shouldn't be that stressful or that scary. Mm. So the support that comes from the SLEE, um, you know, and we do have housing force tenants as well um, and the support that they get. They need it um, to help them because it's a scary time. You've talked about people who've never had a key to their own door. All of a sudden they've got a key to their own door. They've also got responsibilities. They've got responsibilities to pay bills. They're, they're looking around their community and they're thinking, where do I fit in? You know, so that support is so important to do that. Mm. Um, and the support can stay there for as long as needed. Um, it usually takes a couple of months and then it drops off. Mm. Um, but again, if they're struggling or if there is a time or if we notice something. So we would do inspections. We would do link-ins as well. And if we notice something, um, we would link in with them and we would see if they need support. And then we would link them back in with whatever's needed. Mm. And I think just going back to that piece again, I think, I know for me anyway, when I first started working in the sector, like I... I don't think I fully appreciated just how scary that could be yeah. because you think oh my god keys to my own house amazing happy ending yeah but I suppose it's a bit like you know talking to you know people in the the clinical side of Dublin Simon as well we talk about people who kind of are in recovery it's like it's that sustaining it piece do yeah. you know what I mean it's like I've gotten to my end goal I've I've reached cloud nine I've got my own place oh god now I have to hang on to it do yeah. you know what I mean it's that's not the end of the story it's staying there then yeah. after that you know and you could be talking about someone, as I said, if the if the attendant has been through the system. Yeah. They've had a key worker and we'd often get asked, so you're my new key worker. Mm. And you're saying, no, we're the housing officer. Mm. So who's my key worker? You know, and you're kind of saying, no, this is like the journey. But it, like, obviously, we don't leave them high and dry, you know. Mm. But that that would be a, a, a thing to me if we heard someone saying that we're going right. Link, make sure they linked in because they, we don't want people to struggle. Mm. You know, we want them to enjoy their home and mm. then. And you usually find once the support is in and the support then comes out after a couple of months, it comes out that they're grants. But it's a scary, scary time. Yeah. You know, it's in it's called independent housing for a reason. They're yeah. kind of, I suppose, as you say, your key work, you're supported through the, the various places to get to this stage of the journey. Like if you're in emergency accommodation, you have your key worker working with you to move you on yeah. to the next stage. If you're in treatment, you have your key worker working with you. Like this is kind of where the handhold and stops a little bit, isn't it? Yeah, it is. It's independent. We're housing officers. Yeah. So it is. But there is supports in place and there is supports in the community. And mm. you've come from a place of support. So you can tap back into them. But you wouldn't. Most of the time people are ready, but it's still scary. It doesn't mean that they're not ready. It just, it's mm. still scary, though, mm. Um, taking that next step off. And you're wondering, will I make it? Mm. Or what will I do? Mm. And being on your own, you're, you're going into a place where it could be 40 people. You know, and all you want is peace and quiet. 
but then you can get peace and quiet and then you're thinking oh my god where's the noise mm. <laughs> do you know so we can mm. kind of change a little bit as well yeah um, it's just it's different mm. and change is hard for lots of people regardless whether you're in homeless or not change is hard for mm. lots of people so mm. you know no 100% and I suppose then again your team's role so you guys are your housing officers you're not key workers but I suppose the beauty of that as Dublin Simon is an AHB and approved housing body is that it's not just dealing with somebody who has no idea or no experience of what our cl- what the client or resident has gone through. Yeah. So you guys, like yourself, you've worked in 20 All odd, a small odd, a small odd, a small odd, 20 <laughs> odd years um, in various different social yeah. sectors. So you're 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 operating this kind of um formal kind of like, you know, role. But at the same time, it's, it's focused on them keeping mm-hmm. their tenancy at the end of the day. So it's still even though it's not as supportive, it's more independent than the key worker piece. You're still coming at it from that perspective. And that's the difference, I guess, between somebody coming through an approved housing body versus somebody coming through private rented. Yeah. Do you know? All of my team have a support background. Yeah. All my team have come from support. Mm. They have worked in various positions, mm. residential services, working with homeless from whatever way they've come through, whether it's addiction or prisons. Mm. Um, they've all come through that. So they mm. know one of one of my team is with Dublin Simon 22 years, you know, so they well know what it is for someone on their journey. Mm. Um, and that's what makes them great housing officers. Yeah. You know, that's what makes them um, so successful at their job because they don't just cut the, the apron spr- string, so to speak. Do you know, mm. they mm. as much as I keep saying we're housing officers, there is that support piece in them like myself. It doesn't just go away just because you change your title or you change your role. It's in you. You know, people that get into the, these jobs, they're in them for a reason um, and they're good at them for a reason. And you only last that long if you're good at them. Yeah. So, you know, it's in us. And what the difference is, I suppose, is that we will do an element of the support. We do the support and then we signpost on and then we'll tap in and tap out because mm. we want to be we want to treat people as though it's independent. We want them to be successful. We don't want them to be relying on us, mm-hmm. you know. So, mm-hmm. um, but yeah, we do. We do tap in, and sometimes it is more than often than not as well. We will tap in if there's an issue. Yeah, you know, so. and I'd say is it is it hard then because obviously the the view point of like the, the independent housing, it's like people <clears throat> as you say who've been institutionalized, who've had support the whole way through to kind of get back to that point where they're reintegrating into society. I mean, independence, like ha- independent housing, living independently is the end goal. It's what yeah. I suppose they would have done before they fell into homelessness in the first place. Mm-hmm. So do you think it's it's hard for you guys as obviously as housing officers, but all with its support background to be like, no, no, don't, don't. Yep. You have to, you have yep. to hold back. You have to, I suppose, give the person the opportunity to flex their independence and yep. to, to grow. Is because they're well able, you know, yeah. majority well able to, to do, to live independently, but it's scary. So, you know, it's this, it's nearly like the role of a parent, you know, letting go. And when I'm not saying that, that does, I hope that doesn't come across derogatory or anything no, like no, no, that. No. Um, that's not what I mean, but it's like you have to let people find their own feet, you know, and once they find their own feet, then they get stronger at it and then they enjoy it and then they are independent. Mm. And that's always what the end goal is. Mm. Mm. Um, what would what would happen to the clients if, say, the independent housing service wasn't around? Would they be, it, where would they be? What would happen? Um, well, I suppose they'd still be on a list. They'd still be in a service on a list. Mm. You know, maybe trying to access the private rented market. Mm. Um, we know how hard that is. You know, trying to access the, the private market. Um, yeah, I think that's where they'd be. Is still on a list somewhere in the service. So you've outlined like obviously the stresses of, you know, living in homeless services and what that feels like. And I suppose you guys as housing officers would experience helping people in their new tenancy and as they're kind of, you know, link them in with unnecessary supports. If somebody was to go from a homeless service into private rented, like that would be no support. That would be them. You know, we've all seen, as you say, the queues down the road to like get into a property in the first yeah. instance. Like that, that that's what would be on the cards for people who've already been through so much trauma. Getting it is the hard part. Mm. So if you get it, then you're lucky enough to get it. But then also there's no security in it. Mm. You know, we all know that there's no security in it. It's not your forever home. Mm. You're renting. Mm. It's your temporary home. Mm-hmm. So where do you go then? And the risk is always falling back into the homeless, homelessness, you yeah. know. Um, so that's, I think, where people will be. Mm. And that's not OK. No. And I suppose with, you know, the the houses and the forever homes we provide, they are forever homes, right? Forever homes, yeah. 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 
Yeah. We do have um, some properties that are on a lease, you know, like a rental. We have a small number of them. Mm. But by and large, we would adore our, our forever homes. Mm. Okay. okay, what's the hardest part of your job? Um, The hardest part of the job... Uh, well, there's a couple of hard parts of the job. Well, go for it. Give us, give us them all. Um, We've all day. Yeah. I think one of the biggest parts of the job is you have someone and maybe the tenancy is not successful mm. because of that struggle, because something's happened. Um, and then we end up on the losing it. And you see people that aren't able for it, aren't able for the independent living. And you identify with some, you identify someone that needs maybe more support. And at this stage in their life, they're not able for independent living and they need more support. And trying to maneuver that can be very difficult because it usually means that something has happened in that person's life mm. to bring about. So it could be a relapse. It could be then relapses can end up back in treatment and back out as well. Do you know, like, but it could be just that the tenancy just wasn't able and this person needs support. And you identify that. But it, at, but by doing that, you're really taking away someone's forever home, mm. which is not what we get into the business of doing. Mm. You know, our, our end goal is always to give it, but you're nearly taking it away or you're encouraging them to, to realise that they need support. Mm. But it's not a failure. I never see it as a failure because it's OK. It's where you are in your life. Mm -hmm. If you need supported accommodation, if you need long term supported accommodation, that's OK. Mm -hmm. That doesn't mean that you failed. Mm. It's just unfortunate that the circumstances have brought you there. Mm. So that can be heartbreaking is when the tenancy can, can break down. Mm. Um, because as I said, at the end, the end game is always to keep people in their tenancies. Mm. Yeah. So if, if you see a tenancy breaking down, it's tough. And you say that typically would be kind of maybe drama a person's experiencing in their life that would just cause them not to be able to sustain, not to be able to keep up with their bills, yeah. not to be able to keep up with their... Being you know, vulnerable would be a big one. Yeah, you know, okay. the bills part is nearly the easy part because like that you can put back in maybe sleep support or we can support and set up yeah. all the orders and, you know, link in and maybe try and recuperate and try and do plans and mabs and all them things are out mm. there for that. It would be the vulnerability part where you see people that um their house maybe get used you know, um, their mm. they, their friends. I might say that in inverted commas mm. come in. <clears throat> um, the, an element of antisocial behaviour comes in. Mm -hmm. You know, and mm -hmm. it's not usually the tenants; it's mm -hmm. their visitors as well. But mm -hmm. they haven't they haven't got the strength or the ability to say no. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, and that can lead to the demise of a tenancy. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. and it can be really tough to watch that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, but in saying that, then we have had ones where before where the tenancy has ended. We have seen someone go into their journey where they'd end up back in homelessness mm. and then we've seen them in supported accommodation and they're thriving, mm. you know, so that's OK. Mm -hmm. Then they can always do it again. They can mm. always try again if that's what they want to do. Mm. And maybe they're more aware now. So it's not, it's sad to see at the time because nobody wants to see anybody feel like that, you know, and they f don't feel great because obviously their tenancy, their mm. home has been taken away or they're, mm. they're giving up their home. Um, But yeah, that can be definitely, that for me is the hardest part of the job. No, it sounds really tough. Yeah. And I suppose, you know, obviously just to put in context as well, that if, if it's a, say if it's an, a, the property is an apartment in a whole, whole you know, host of other apartments um, and it's pepper potted, as you say, like obviously there will be in the same way that anyone has an apartment of their own, even if it's, you know, an apartment they've bought, if it's an apartment that's a forever home to an HB, there's always going to be a set of, I suppose, obligations that that person has to, has to follow. Yeah. So yeah. what, what are some of the key kind of, criteria I suppose for people to s sustain as you say sustain their their tenancies it's just being a good neighbour yeah it's as simple as that there's mm -hmm. no hard and fast rules there's no mm -hmm. it's just being a good neighbour mm -hmm. it's being considerate of your neighbours it's you know looking after your property um, being responsible for your visitors being mm -hmm. responsible for yourself mm -hmm. you know and that's basically it it's just being a good neighbour like everybody mm -hmm. yeah mm -hmm. and by and large I have to say all of our tenants are you know they're in their forever home and sometimes we don't hear from, from them at all mm. because they're so grateful to have their forever home and mm. they're so happy and they never, ever, ever want to go back to where they were before. Mm. Um, And, it, you know, you tap in and you, you know, you see, okay, and they're like, yeah, I'm grand, mm. you know. um, Yeah, so that's that's kind of the nice part as well. But yeah, being a good neighbour mm. is basically all, it's all it boils down to. Yeah. um, And th this is something that I suppose we see a lot, like in our line of work, but... You know, 
I imagine there can be elements of not my backyard sometimes as well when it comes to when it comes to different properties that somebody who's come from a homeless service is living in. There can be maybe elements of, you know, people being aware that the person has come from a particular background yeah. and not being welcoming of them in the community. And do you see that too? Yeah, we have. Yeah, yeah, you would. And people have a perception before they once they realise it's a Dublin Simon home and, you know, yeah. it's a homeless and people have a perception mm. when they come in. Most people are, don't mind, again, as long as you're a good neighbour, don't care where you came from, mm-hmm. you know, or, mm-hmm. or what the background is. But yes, yeah, sometimes there would be that element of not in my backyard. Mm. You would have that. Yeah. And it, it can be difficult, you know, because you're trying to change people's views and what can you do? You mm. know, it's, you, you do, you try and work with them. But obviously that person has a right to live in that property as well. Mm-hmm. Um, And you're trying to say to them, you know, you're entitled to be here just as much as they're entitled to be there. This is your forever home. Mm-hmm. And do you think that there's maybe like an education piece that needs to needs to happen with people? And it comes back, all comes back to that again, that there's no stereotype. There's people, you know, there's no stereotype for somebody who's experienced homelessness because it can, it can happen to anyone. Like uh, For there again, we've had people that have, you know, where the community maybe wouldn't know that it's a Dublin Simon house. Mm. And it wouldn't be on t- for whatever reason then that we get involved and they're shocked mm-hmm. that oh my god I didn't realise and we've had people as well that says when I heard that that was a Dublin Simon house and I was expecting like I didn't know what to expect coming up the door and then when I seen them I was thinking oh my god and then their kids are friends with their kids and you know like they're great pals and their communities and they people have said like shame on me thinking like that mm. you know so mm. fair play to them being honest with it you know but I think some people, if you're not used to it, you know, as I said, like I have a whole background in it. and mm. So if you're not used to it, there it can be scary as well, not known, because you might have an idea in your head of what it is. Yeah. Um, I wonder as well, would those people, maybe some of them are listening, mm-hmm. um, would those people be, I suppose, a bit, you know, who, who might have a perception or a prejudice view, I suppose, knowing that there's such a wall of support behind each person who goes in. Do you know what I mean? That if, you know, obviously we've talked about the independent piece, but there's been... A level of support to get them there. And as you say, there's a level of support they can tap back into if they need. Do you know what I mean? That there's, they're, they're not, they're independent, but they, if if they need support, it, they can have it on tap. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, we we look, we've listened to the derogatory comments from neighbours and management companies and all, you know, like these are, they're mortgage properties. You'd, you'd hear those phrases, you know, and I'd say, yep, and so is that one. Yeah. And that's, that's their house, mm-hmm. you know. So, yeah, we, we would have had that, uh, you know, but you just, it's like anything in life. You just have to say, you know, God loved them. That's that's their issues, not mine. Mm-hmm. And then you have to, when we were talking to the tenants, you say, don't mind them. Mm-hmm. You know, that's their issues, not yours. Mm-hmm. You're well entitled to be here. This is your home. Mm-hmm. You treat it like that. You know, so it's, that there, it's only a smaller group, though, that are like that. I will mm-hmm. say that. It's a very small amount. I mean, when you think of the amount of houses we have and the amount of communities that we have, mm-hmm. It's a very small number that would have that perception. Mm-hmm. Okay, that's good to hear. What's the best part of your job? The best part of my job is giving someone their keys. That is the best part of my job, you know. Um, and the housing officers get to do it more than I do. And every now and again, I'd say, anyone giving out keys this week? Can I go with just... <laughs> <laughs> to get the high. <laughs> yes, yes, to get the high. Yeah. 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 Um, it's, it's the natural part of the job. It is... It's a natural buzz, you know, it's, it really is when you're at the interview on someone and you're, you know, you're doing everything and you see what they've come through, you've listened to them and yeah, and then you get to give the keys. That is the best part of the job. 100% there's no ifs, ands or buts about it. Mm. And anyone that's in the support and homeless sector will tell you that. Mm. Yeah, giving someone the keys to that door is, is brilliant. Yeah. Um, do you remember any particular ones, any particular, um, I suppose cases where you gave someone the keys and it was just like it, it, it just you could see like that it was life changing. Do you know every single one of them? Really? Every single one of them. Mm. There's no one that stands out. Every person that gets their keys in, as I said, not just this, but in the whole career, any person that moves on, I guess, their, their keys, it's the same feeling. It's the same. Oh, my God, I can't believe it. I can't believe this day has come. I can't believe this finally happened. Mm. Um, This is brilliant. It's great. I'm going to paint the blue. I'm going to paint the pink. I'm going to get this. I'm going to get that. It's like, yep, it's yours. You do what you want with it. Is it okay if I do this? It's yours. You do what you want. You know, Mm -hmm. within reason. (laughs) (laughs) But yeah, 
Um, has there been any wild decors or anything? Oh yeah, hundred yeah, percent. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> anything that um, sticks out? Wild animals, animals, and oh yeah, no, we have, we have seen a few of them as well. But <laughs> look, each did our own. Do you yeah. know, that's that's it's their home. Yeah, so and they can do what they want with it. Yeah, they can do what they want. And I think as well, like something that I've seen just from speaking to people in like the emergency services is that like when people have been, you know, haven't had their own space, haven't had their own place to be able to express their identity in themselves, like mm. when when they finally get that opportunity it's like an explosion yeah. like do you know what I mean because they've they've been moving from you know bedroom to bedroom like in whatever homeless service or mm-hmm. maybe from one homeless service to another and never had something that they could just call their own like yeah, yeah. and you, you'll see it in the touches like you'll see the sense of pride yeah when you go in you know and our visits will be nearly always scheduled you know yeah, so they'd yeah, always yeah. be waiting and you know and you nearly go home thinking oh god I better go home and do something with my own house yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know they'd, they'd have it absolutely gorgeous and mm. so welcoming and so warm and welcoming and mm. you know delighted to show it off and why not yeah 100% yeah. Um, what do you wish was different about your job um, availability mm. for properties you know for properties to, to be more available mm. Um, for the process to be quicker, you know, yeah, that people didn't end up in the situations that they ended up in. Yeah. Yeah, all those things. So we, you said at the start, we we provide how many, roughly how many uh, 288 units? 288 at the moment. 288 independent housing units, that's mm-hmm. what we provide. Over five counties. Over five counties. Um, in those five counties, there's still oh, almost 8,000 people, over 8,000 people who are experiencing homelessness and emergency accommodation. So 288 properties is... Yeah. Is great, but it's 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 not it's a fraction really of what's of what's of what the problem is. Do you know yeah. what I mean? So I guess um, it would be amazing if we could get more properties like that and have more have a bigger team and have you know be able to facilitate more people. Do you know what I mean? But the I suppose with with you know even with the private rented with people who are trying to get mortgages at the moment, properties just aren't available. Yeah, and it's difficult. And I'm, <clears throat> you know, as you're talking there, it brings me back, as I said, many moons ago, I remember walking in homeless services. And I think it was around 2006, thereabouts. I think, could be wrong now, but I remember this new government strategy came out and it was called the Key to the Door. Mm. So a Key to the Door strategy came out and there was, I think it was 10 points and it was going to end homelessness by 2010. So mm. it was going to end homelessness. So that was a strategy that we had mm-hmm. a long time ago. And I remember thinking, oh my God, I'm going to be out of a job in 2010. What am I going to do? Um, because here's all the answers. You know, we, we have a plan. Was going, and then 2010 came and I think after that we just hit the crisis then as well with family mm. homelessness, which was the first mm. that we would have had. Um, and yet we still have massive lists. You just said there, 8,000. You know, so yeah, what can we do to help? Yeah, we need more properties. We need more availability. We need to have all that thing going. But we need to have an answer to it as well. We shouldn't have this many people. You're always going to have an element of homelessness. Always. But we shouldn't have this. And people should not be stuck in homelessness for this long. They should get the supports that they need. And if it's long term, it's long term. If it's short term, it's short term. You know, whatever it is that the person needs, that's what we need. Mm. I mean, we're part of Europe. I look around the other European countries as well and how they manage it. They don't have the crisis that we have. Mm. They don't have the tents that we have. Do you know, they don't have the lists that we have. Mm-hmm. So... I mean, you think about that strategy came out, I think it was 2007. I definitely know that the end goal was 2010, that we were going to have no homeless people anymore. You know, and here we are 13 years later. Mm. And look at the list, as you just said, there are 8,000 people. Yeah, the worst that it's ever been since we started, yeah. since numbers started being recorded. And I guarantee you that there's people still on that list that were on it back then when that strategy came out. There are people still on the on the, on the list, on the waiting list. You know? Yeah. So I think that's what we need to do as well, as we need to... This is me going on a bit of a soapbox now, which I Go said I it. wouldn't do. It's for. <laughs> we need to hold our elected officials accountable. Mm-hmm. You know, if they said they did this 13, 16 years ago, whatever it was, they said they were going to end it. Uh, where are we now? So we need to hold them accountable. Mm-hmm. You know, we shouldn't have this much of a crisis at this mm-hmm. stage. Mm-hmm. We shouldn't. Yeah. We've had a Celtic tiger. We've had a recession. Mm-hmm. Where are we now? You know, you can't keep blaming everything and everything. You know, we've we've had money, we've had no money mm-hmm. and we still had our, like really high numbers of homelessness. Mm-hmm. So I think that's for me is, you know, yeah, we definitely need more properties. We definitely need the rules to be better. We definitely need the private market to be more secure and more open 
Um, so it's not a stigma if you're in private rented. Mm. You know, you look at European countries, people in Europe rent forever mm -hmm. and it's no big deal because mm -hmm. mm -hmm. they're secure. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. So we, they have the protections, I suppose. They have the yeah, protections. Yeah, yeah. That's it. But also the landlords have protections. The landlords have protections. And that's Do a key know? piece, I think, that yeah. when we're talking about, you know, people who are experiencing homelessness on the verge of homelessness, I think the landlord can get very, you know, stigmatised. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? And I can understand, you know, people have horror stories and have had bad experiences, but landlords are essential to the private rented market for it to function properly, yeah. right? It, it can't all be private. So, you know what I mean? We need, we need the balance. As mm. I said, in other European countries, we need the balance. Mm. So like, yeah, landlords need to be protected as well. You know, we're a landlord as well. So <laughs> effectively mm. as an AHB, that's what mm. we are. So landlords need to be protected and the tenant needs to be protected, mm. you know? And mm. I think that's where we need to go. Mm. We, the, it's a bigger piece, you know, and we need to be accountable. And it's a long term piece as well. Exactly. Mm. Like there's people, I, I think in Holland, they, like they've rented up to their ages 60, you know, and it's absolutely no big deal at all. They're quite happy, quite secure. Mm. Landlords happy, landlords protected, you know, and we need to look at around and see what they do and start to copy it. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, we've kind of in terms of how people can li listen, can help, I suppose, how they can support us. Um, you guys obviously work very closely with our capital development fundraising team. Yeah. Um, so we'll have oh, yeah. actually somebody on in a couple of weeks' time talking about, you know, how people can get involved there. Is there anything, anything in particular you're we thinking have, of? We've been so lucky as well to have donor properties as well. Yeah. So where people have allowed us to purchase a property or they've given over a property to us. Um, and they're the ones that were saying it's kind of, you know, the, the rented side of it. But again, we say that it is their forever home. Like they can decorate it. They can do what they want. You know, it is their home. Um, and that's, it's been great to have them as well. Like, and we've been able to just kind of pick people. They were not, not nominated it's through the council. They're, they've come through. So yeah, it's been great to have them that we can see when someone, and it's usually they've been in there like a short time as well. Mm. And, and quick kill. Mm. Yeah. So mm. it's good. So yeah, no, we do need to do that. But you know, we we need to keep going and doing what we do and do what we do best, mm -hmm. uh, because that is what we're good at. Mm -hmm. Um, but we also then, as I suppose morally, we need to kind of look at our elected officials and make them accountable as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, and the ones from sixteen years ago who made that lovely plan mm -hmm. in two thousand and ten, mm -hmm. and say, well, where are we now? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. No, one hundred percent. Okay, my very last question. Um, what is home for you? Um, home to me is safe. One word, safe. It's a safe space. Mm. It's a space where I can be me. You can be you. You can breathe. You can relax. You can leave your worries outside. You know, it's a safe space. Obviously, whatever's going on for you in your life, you're going to have to be dealing with as well. The good, the bad, the ugly. But it's a safe space where you can deal with that. You know, that's that's basically what home is for me. Amazing. Well, Len, thank you so much for joining no us problem. today on Season 2 of the Streets of Dublin Simon podcast. <laughs> ah, brilliant. You're very good. Um, yeah, thanks so much. Okay, cheers. Thank you for listening. To find out how you can help, visit www.dubsimon.ie Dublin Simon. Homeless, not less.